As I was stepped down and was in worship this morning with you, and worship team, thank you so much um, for your ministry and how you usher in the presence of God. Uh, I just, I just sense the Lord inspiring me just to prophesy something specifically to you this morning. And for those of you that this may seem a little bit weird, how many of you know that God is still talking? And that the primary way that God speaks to us is through this Bible. That's the 99%. Amen? Uh, why? Because it's 66 canons, 66 books of the canon. Uh, everything in there is the Word of God. It's inspired by God. If it says genuine leather, it means a cow died for that, that Bible. Um, but God also speaks to us yet still through revelatory means. Uh, he speaks to us through the gift of prophecy. He speaks to us, Ephesians 4, that God has given to the church, prophets. And so we know that while contemporary utterance is nowhere near at the same measure as Scripture, amen, we, but God is still encouraging us. 1 Corinthians 14, 3, strengthen, encourage, comfort as the word comes. I mean, I could look in my Bible when I was a young, dumb, you know, 18-year-old. If a man finds a wife, he's found a good thing. Well, I could agree with that. I just didn't know which good thing. I didn't know what her name was until God sovereignly, supernaturally said, her. Amen? And so we believe that God still talks to us very specifically in this hour. Everybody good with that? So far, amen. So the Lord said to you, my sons and daughters, I'm coming to break the dam, not only in this church, but I'm coming to break the dam in your personal lives. Even, says the Lord, as Baal Perazim, the Lord breaketh out. Hear me, says the Lord. Some of you have felt like there have been certain promises made that not only have been in delay, but they have been damned up. And they have been waiting for something to come. And there has been a demonic dam that has been placed in many of your lives, says the Lord, that has kept that which I have stored since the beginning of time from flowing in your direction. And I want you to hear, says the Lord, that I am the breacher of dams. I am the breaker of dams that is holding back that which I have ordained. And I would also say to this house is that there is a sudden flood and a rising tide that is going to come as I break the dam that even has been arrayed and allied against this church. It has nothing to do with sin. It has nothing to do with preparation, but it has been a demonic dam holding back what has been promised and prophesied to this church, not only for this location, but for decades, says the Lord. Hear me, says the Lord. I am breaking the dam over this church. I saw in the Spirit... I saw in the Spirit traffic backed up trying to get to this building. And I know you guys, I was told coming in this morning that you had parking lots and, and, and parking arrangements. Congratulations, you'll need more. And I saw in the Spirit, I saw lines of cars, I saw taillights as people were trying to get here because the river is about to be released through this church. I say it to you this morning, says the Lord. Amen. Can we thank the Lord for that word? It is such a joy to be with you in your absolutely gorgeous place that you live here in paradise. Uh, it's just amazing to be here with your pastor and his wife and the team here. Thank you for your hospitality. But let me say to you, even as Pastor Greg was sharing about perspective, let me say to you that the church with all of its challenges, all of its warts and wants, is that the church is about to come into its most glorious hour in our lifetime. I believe that. And let me just tell you, my wife, who has persevered with me, talk about perseverance, for 45 years of marriage, all right? If you didn't believe in miracles before now, now you believe that anybody could live with me for 45 years and not commit a homicidal act. Um, 
but she can tell you that I am by trade not an optimist. I tend to be a glass half empty kind of guy. But let me say to you that prophetically, that what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing, is that the church is about to become into its just most glorious version of anything we've ever seen. And ladies and gentlemen, the church is not just some organizational structure. It's not a time. It's not a place. You are that church. And that God is about to do some amazing things in your midst. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe that God has shown me that as well. The second service, I, I gave a prophetic word to this church. And um, without trying to re-prophesy it, I'm sure it was recorded. You can go back and listen to it. But just by way of encapsulation and, and reiteration, just to kind of say that there is a dam that God is breaking. I want you to hear this. There's been a dam that many of you have felt in your own personal lives. There's certain promises that you know are dammed up behind this structure. And I believe that God is coming to break the dams in your lives. And some of it is relational. Some of it is, is physical in your own bodies. Some of it is financial, jobs, just, just everything that you know that whether it's been a promise that's come out of that word or a promise that's come to you prophetically, that, that, that there's, there's been a demonic dam that has kept that flow from coming. But I'm, I'm here to tell you, God's blowing up dams in this day. And that that which has been promised and has been under pressure is about to be released in and through your life. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. All right. You know, Isaiah 9 and, the pro, and, and Matthew quoted it in chapter 4, but in Isaiah 9, we find this passage of Scripture, which I believe is so applicable to where we have been and where we're headed. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. How many of you know that we have been living in that land under a shadow of death since the first part of 2020? And whether or not you had the virus, someone in your family, maybe you buried someone in your family that somehow that virus compromised their bodies and they died. But every one of us have been affected in some way. Economically, some people lost jobs. I mean, as, as wonderful as it is that the prophetic word about about building came forth, I mean, Hawaii, your state, it was rocked to its very, very core. Because if people can't travel, what makes the economy of this place works is people getting on an airplane and flying over here. And so you guys experienced firsthand what it was like to live underneath that shadow. But look at this promise. A light has dawned. And you have enlarged the nation, increased their joy, say joy, they rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. And part of that rejoicing is this amazing harvest that God is about to bring in in this hour. Hear me. We find in Scripture a very unique individual. James talks about this man that we, he was a man just like us. Uh, however, I, I, I know what James was saying in terms of living a life of faith, but I don't think any of us, like the prophet Elijah, have ever commanded the weather to do anything and it respond. I mean, the best we've got is rain, rain, go away, come again some other day. That's about all we got in terms of, of, of authority over the heavens. But we find the first thing the prophet Elijah doing when he shows up in 1 Kings 17 is that he is pronouncing a curse on Israel. Now that's an auspicious way to make an entrance into history, is declaring a curse. Whereby which you are cutting off hydration and by extension you know that because agriculture is completely dependent on rain, there's going to be no rain, there's going to be no agriculture. If there's no agriculture, there's going to be no food. No food, it means famine. Famine means economic collapse and societal insecurity. This is what Elijah was prophesying, was cursing Israel with. 
And it's just like, was he in a bad mood? No, it was God's reaction and response, if you wish, to Israel's apostasy. And so for three and a half years, Israel lived in this drought. Now, we have to be very, very careful with what I'm about to say, but it's interesting that we know from the Bible that it was a three and a half year period. And yet, if you consider the beginning of 2020 to where we are now in the summer of 2023, we are in a very, we're in the same time frame, three and a half years. And I believe that God is breaking the drought and that rain from heaven is not only beginning to fall, it is falling. A prologue is an event that sets up another event. Myself and others at the beginning of 2020 not having any idea the magnitude that this virus was going to have on the globe prophesied that God was about to drag a plow through the nations and through the church. And that plow was going to open furrows for the seed of the gospel and for the reign of revival to begin to flow through. Now, what's interesting is how many of you know that God does everything in accordance with His providence, His plan? God doesn't do anything in reaction. God always has a plan. I think it's so cool, for instance, that God made water before he made fish. I just think that's neat, don't you? I mean, if I'd been God, I got excited about the fish and they'd been flopping around, but no, I'm teasing. But, but God does, he's got a plan for everything. And so as we look, and we looked at the season that many of us have come out of, that Isaiah prophesied about, we can see that God was making this elaborate preparation. And he wasn't just doing it in one's place, if you look at the history of revivals, whether First or Second Great Awakening or the Welsh Revival, uh, the, the, you know, Azusa Street, other places, they were all uniquely geographically constrained. What makes this different is it's, it's, it's global effect. Is that this wasn't just one people's, one nation. This was the entire globe was affected simultaneously by this pandemic. And something that just seemed just just so otherworldly almost, which in reality was. Did the devil get involved? He always does. Because the devil always exploits moments of transition and weakness. But what we have to see is that this was God's divine prologue to setting up an event that sets up another event. And it wasn't just the end of COVID. It was the beginning of revival. And yet, here we are. This church I was in in Texas in January, my wife and I ministered there. It's the first time they'd had prophetic ministry in in many years, apparently. And God did, it was, a, it was a pretty amazing weekend, all in all. And a few months later, the pastor texted me, and he said, Hello, Pastor. Hope all is well. Things here have just exploded since your visit in January. Have almost, listen to this, 4,000 saved this year. Over 100 verifiable healings and miracles and hundreds baptized in the water and water and the Holy Spirit. Amazing. That's one church. We have a church plant in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It's only been going here now for a couple of years. They planted during COVID. Tough time to plant a church. But the church is 100 plus or so. And yet, since the beginning of this year, they've baptized 150 people in a church of 100. (laughs) February of 1970. A little school in Wilmore, Kentucky. What is historically known as the Asbury Revival. You may have heard of it. But just a bunch of students hanging out after a chapel meeting. Hungry for God. Hanging and hungry. It's a new definition of hangry, by the way. (laughs) But there was no charismatic personality, no preaching, no altar call, no worship team, no nothing. Just some students hungry for God. And in that moment, God fell. And a little school in Wilmore, Kentucky. My wife's brother was a student during this revival. So we have firsthand testimony from this. But I want you to look at this next picture. 
from February of 2023. Same room, same revival, 53 years later. Is it the same, exact same set of circumstances? Some, some hangry students just wanting more of God, and God fell. Many of you may have read about this. Not only did, this, did, did, did the um, church media pick this up, but the secular media picked this up because it became a real phenomenon. But it, it wasn't just one school in Wilmore, Kentucky. It began to move from campus to campus and location to location. Revival, ladies and gentlemen, what we were prophesying some months and maybe even a year or two ago, we're just reporting the news now. Here it is. And we had, uh, we have a church planner in Denver, Colorado, David Hermes and his wife, Megan. David called me when this revival began to break out and it was reported. And he said, Pastor, he said, I know that so many people are going to Wilmore. They're, they're buying tickets and they're getting in this revival. He said, I don't want to go to Wilmore. I want Wilmore to come to Denver. And I said, David, that's the greatest thing that's ever come out of your mouth. I said, because if you want that as a pastor, you'll get it. Let me just tell you. And ladies and gentlemen, your church, your family, your life is not exempt from this moment in God. I want you to hear this. And God, and, and, and who can figure? But in this moment, he has chosen you and me and this generation in this moment in time to steward this amazing outpouring. Amazing. But it begs some questions for you and for me. What do we do? How do we prepare? We heard your pastor talk about responding to a prophetic word that came to him at a time where you weren't buying buildings. Churches weren't even able to meet. What a terrible time to buy real estate. It's ridiculous. And yet, heard, but then did something with what he heard. He made preparation. It wasn't just expectation. It was expectation married to what? Preparation. You see, many times we think faith, and we know the biblical definition of that is what? The assurance of things hoped for, not yet seen. You know that's great. Expectation. And we know that life is a series of what? Expectations. Some are met, some are unmet. And some of the unhappiest people that I've ever met are people that establish their own expectations expecting other people or expecting God to meet their expectations. Some people call that prayer. And yet Ephesians 5 says, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You want your prayer life to be energized? Find out what the will of God is and get in agreement with it. Because the answer will always be yes when you figure that out. We're not Moses. And I don't think Moses even changed God's mind. Are you with me? And so we're not trying to change God's mind through our intercession or our expectations. And so once we establish then, what are those expectations? Then, all of a sudden, our life begins to make some sense. But you see, we come into a moment of, a moment of revival, and we all, whether we know it or not... We have an expectation of what does it look like for my life to get into a moment like this. What does it look like of those challenges that I've had in my physical body, in my marriage, with my children, in the workplace, my finances, all of these areas that have been under stress and been under tribulation, does revival mean all of a sudden they're going to change? Right. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. But it's critical that we begin to come into a right set of expectations plus preparation. That's where faith is fully manifested. It's expectation plus what? Preparation. A woman who's pregnant. And she knows she's pregnant. You know, you know, you, you know doctors have established that. And, and so, but a woman never goes to the hospital and has a baby. This is how men describe birth, by the way, ladies. This is why God didn't give men a uterus, because yeah. first time man had a baby, they'd have gotten together and said, dude, don't do it. Don't, just don't do it. That'd been the end of the species right there. 
And so a woman has a baby. She's had 40 weeks of what? Expectation. And then she has the little burrito. And they put the little burrito on the bed, and then finally the insurance company says, you got to go home now. The most terrifying moment of my life, other than being married, was when they put our first little burrito down on the bed and said, you have to leave. And I'm like, you're going with us, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, it was a terrifying moment to realize that this little person was looking to us to stay alive. It was, it was horrible. All right, so... But the little person made it, by the way, and has since reproduced on his own. So that's a good thing. (laughs) But there's been no mother in modern day in in, in Western culture that was riding home from the hospital with her husband holding the burrito in her lap. No, no, no. We had the NASA designed seat in the back. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and so, but what are we going to do with him when he gets, when, when we get home? But maybe we need to get a box from the store. No, 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 no. For that period of time, there was a lot of preparation made. Come on, ladies. You Pinterested. You, you painted the wall once you figured out, you know, what, whether the little burrito was a he or a she. I mean, you were ready. My wife was cleaning behind the refrigerator the week she delivered. I'm like, how is the burrito going to get it behind the refrigerator? But it's called nesting. It's that preparation that kicks in. But this is, this is what begs the question for you and for me. How do we align our expectations and our preparation so that we don't miss any of what God is pouring out? Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. If there's anything about God, He never wastes Himself. He will never pour himself out on a place or a people that are ill-prepared to receive that which he wants to do. He just doesn't do it. And I don't know about you, but I want to be in a place in my life of the right preparation. That particularly when we come into such a prophetic moment like the one that we're in, that we get everything God is pouring out. And we find two stories in Scripture. One is in Matthew chapter 25, and those of you that have been around the church for a moment, you know this one. It's the story of the ten virgins. Now, we know in Scripture there are two types, and a type is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Water happens to be one. Oil happens to be another. So if you'll allow me this morning, I want to look at two passages of Scripture, one from New Testament, one from Old, that highlight oil. And the importance in receiving that which God is doing. Now, Matthew 25 is a story of ten virgins. They're betrothed to a bridegroom. And it says that five brought extra oil for their lamps and five didn't. Now, as is often the case, it says the bridegroom was a long time in coming. How many of you know that many times, even once God has made a promise... Sometimes God is a long time in coming because there's something that gets developed in us between God's word and the delivery of that word. Something gets developed in in the life of a disciple called patience, faith, perseverance. Come on. And so here we are. And in that moment, and it says they got weary and they fell asleep. There's a response. How in the world could they do that? Well, Jesus' own guys, his closest compadres, they fell asleep on him in his moment of greatest need in the garden. And then the cry goes out, he's here. And this is how God, many times he shows up, is that these suddenlies. Is that, hear it? It says that the five that had extra oil, it says they trimmed their lamps with that oil that they had brought, that extra oil. But these five, they realized that they were not going to have enough light to be able to go all the way in. So they say to this five, give us some of yours. And this five said, get your own. We will have enough. Now, that's always bothered me a bit. This seemed like a selfish group over here. But they realized in advance what was going to be necessary somehow. So these five go off to buy oil, find a 24-hour Walmart or something. And while this five were gone, it says the bridegroom arrived. And the five that had come prepared, they went in with joy. And the five came back later banging on the door, let us in. 
but the door was closed. Now, we know this is a parable about salvation. But if you'll allow me this morning for just a moment, it's just to expand on this parable for a moment. First of all, two groups of virgins. They were both qualified to receive. They were virgins. They both had the same information and the same revelation. The bridegroom is coming. Not unlike the information and revelation you're being given here this morning. They were there. They're in the right place at the right time. And yet, only one group went in. My wife and I have a, or I, I do as, 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 you know, the pater familius and the provider and all that kind of stuff. I have a very um, uncomfortable relationship with oil. My wife and I were given a station wagon. Now, I don't know what it is that all young couples are given station wagons at some point. All right? But we were given a 1973 Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser station wagon. <laughs> now, if you don't know what a Vista Cruiser is, that is the famous car from that 70s show. Now, station wagons, for those of you that are too holy to watch television... Um, Think old school minivan or a hearse with seats in it. It's the best way I know how to describe it. It's a, tr it's a veritable land yacht. And an Oldsmobile, which you don't even know what that is, it was a division of General Motors 100 years ago. All right. And so we were given one of these. And I think that parents give them to their children with the hopes that they will fill them with grandchildren to bring back home. That's my theory. But a light had come on on the dash on the Vista Cruiser. This big red light. And it was around Christmas time, and I thought, well, isn't that special? <laughs> General Motors knows it's Christmas time. Feliz Navidad. I mean, I was really excited about that. And then when I would turn the blinker on, it was a green light. So it was just like I had the whole Christmas thing going on. Except on the way to church one Sunday, after the red light had been on and stayed on for about a month, my car went to car heaven. Something like a death rattle happened from underneath the hood, an unearthly sound that I hope you never have to experience. And my car said, I warned you, we're done. And it, my engine seized up. And so we had the car towed. We did all that stuff. And we had a mechanic in our church at the time. His name is Kenny. I can't remember many things, but in moments of trauma, you can remember weird details. And I remember going to Kenny, and I said, Kenny, can you fix my car? And Kenny did this. If a mechanic ever does that, it's going to be bad news. Yeah. So I went in the back with Kenny, and Kenny reached out and picked up this black gelatinous glob that if, if a demon could have a physical manifestation, is about what it would look like. But he picked this glob up, and he said, this is the oil out of your oil pan. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't understand it, you're not supposed to be able to pick up oil. Yeah. Oil is intended to be liquid, to be a viscous substance that is supposed to flow through all of the moving parts of your engine and keep it happily running. Not unlike your life and mine, which is designed to be lubricated with the presence of the Holy Spirit moving through all the various parts of our life. Right, and God, just like that dashboard, many times will flash on a red light saying, you need to check your oil. You're low. And in this moment, in the natural anyway, I chose to ignore the warning lights on my dash. And my engine seized up. And we use terms in our vernacular now. Well, he's just burnt out. He's just burnt up. Well, why is that? Is that somewhere the intended flow of the Holy Spirit somewhere got blocked in our life? I tell people when they, when they come into my office and they think that I can somehow help them. And I, my first, and my wife can tell you this, my first speech to them is, I can't help you. So let's just get that out of the way right from the beginning. I'm not a trained therapist. I'm not real smart. I cannot help you. But what we can discover together is wherever the flow of God got cut off in your life and help get you reconnected. I can help you with that. 
And so here we are. And this, this oil is now beginning to flow. Rain is coming. But for you and for me, when we hear words like revival, coming into a moment like this, what does it mean for you and I? What are our expectations? Once again, so many times we tend to package these personally. What is it that we want God to do for us? The reality is, even if we look back in history at some of the other great revivals, they may not provide a really helpful blueprint for what this one looks like. Somebody once wrote this. It says, you can never get back into Narnia the same way twice. You got through the wardrobe once. It won't happen again. Leonard Ravenhill said years ago, he said, my great concern about the Pentecostal church is they think they know so much about God and the move of God that they're in the greatest danger of missing the next one because of what they think they know. And let me tell you, that's a, that's, that is a, tr no, no truer statement has ever been made. We think we've got a lock on this because we're in a church that uses guitars <laughs> and project their words up here. And we're not a, quote, historical denomination. But let me just tell you, just because we believe in, in, in the contemporary move of the Holy Spirit, nine spiritual gifts from 1 Corinthians 12, it doesn't mean that we are exempt from not missing God as he shows up in this particular moment. And there are always those that miss him. Pentecost, the birth of the church. The Holy Spirit, of course, we know throughout the Old Testament had shown up before, but not like this. So here's one of these three prescribed feasts of Israel, but in this moment, God said, now. And yet, there was nothing in the law and the prophets about how it happened. Oh, we had prophets, Joel, you know, your, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men would dream dreams, but what was not recorded was what? Rushing wind and tongues of fire. There's no record of that anywhere in the, law, the written law and the prophets. Nothing that we know of in Hebrew oral tradition that would have given people a clue as to what was about to break out. But even there at Pentecost, you always have a couple of different groups of folk. you got folk that are right underneath the water spout. God, I want all you got. Worshiping God in an unknown language. My wife and I were in Israel two or three, couple, two or three years ago, whenever it was. We went up to the ancient site of Shiloh or Shiloh, where the ark reside for, resided for a few hundred years. And we were there, and the presence of God was still so rich in that place. It was amazing. And we began to pray and worship, and a number of us began to ship and speak in tongues in fluent Hebrew, not knowing it. Our tour guide was hearing God worshiped in a language that he only he understood. God's still doing it. And yet, you always have that group that are right here. God, I want all that you've got. But you've got this other group over here saying, they drunk. <laughs> they drunk. And you always are going to be in one group or the next. Either casting aspersions and judgment on this group over here or right underneath the water spout. Let me tell you where you want to be in a moment like this. Amen? And so... What does it look like? What do we do in preparation? You know, there's a second story in the Bible, 2 Kings, the fourth chapter. It's a story of, it's a, story of a, a, a widow of a prophet. She was in financial distress. They had come to sell her kids into slavery. In those days, you didn't have chapter 7, 9, 11, 13, 17, all the prom numbers. In those days, they just came, got your kids, and they sold them. That's how they satisfied debt. So she is in a horrendous situation. And the prophet Elisha, Elijah's disciple Elisha, comes and asks her a simple question, what do you have in the house? And her first response is nothing. The same way that many times that we take an assessment of ourselves and God will ask us, what have you got? And we immediately, God, I got nothing. Could I bring a slight adjustment to that answer? How dare you tell God that you have nothing. In John, it says, as, John, as Jesus was speaking about his departure, he says, it's good I'm going because unless I go, another won't come behind me. Do you realize that the same shed blood 
that dealt with the sin issue on your behalf was the same shed blood that got the Holy Spirit released in your life and mine. How dare we be casual about that? And so to say, God, I don't have anything. Yes, you do. You've got the third person of the living God living on the inside of you. But then she rethinks her, quite, her answer. She says, I do have a little oil. He says, now I can work with that. Tell your boys, go to the neighbors, get every empty container they can find. And they do that. Interesting how the prophet and this mother brings a second generation into this being part of this miracle. They bring these containers in. She starts to pour. And by the way, guys, this is one of the greatest pictures of evangelism in the Old Testament you'll ever see. Go to your neighbors and find every empty vessel that needs to be filled. And they go get these vessels, and she begins to pour. And she pours in these. Think about these urns of antiquity. They're about this tall. And, 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 and this is good oil. This is first pressing stuff. And she knows what it's worth. And so she's like, ka -ching! Get another one, Bubba. So Bubba brings another one on. She pours. ka -ching! And so she continues to pour. And as long as there were empty vessels, you know the story, the oil kept flowing. But when the oil, when, when the vessels got full, what happened? The oil stopped. My goodness. So what do we extract from this passage? First of all is running on empty. You know, we live in a FOMO culture. Fear of missing out, but we live in a faux row culture, which is a fear of running out. And the manifestation of that is Costco and Amazon Prime. And if you don't believe me, I know some of you are just about to go through the last of your COVID hoard toilet paper. Because we were terrified. Remember the great toilet paper shortage of 2021. All right. But we have this fear. We begin to feel something a little empty and gurgly on the inside. And we immediately be, we remember, oh, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I rebuke thee, Satan. But the reality is, maybe that emptiness is there, and it's a good thing. Matthew 5, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for what they will be filled. Yeah, and for many of us, the question is, what are you so full of? You know, that term, you're full of it. That's never intended as a compliment. <laughs> and listen, some of you have been uniquely, divinely emptied. And don't ever underestimate the fact that God will empty you. And, and I'll let your pastor fix this next week. He'll let the devil help him do it. He'll fix that next week. Job, pretty righteous guy, pretty good resume. Have you considered my man Job? And then 40 some odd chapters, we watch the devil empty the man's life for one thing, so that God can reveal who he is at the very end of it. Pretty amazing. And some of you have been in that process. Congratulations. You're right on time. A.W. Tozer said years ago, it's doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he's hurt him deeply. Two, relying on, excuse me, is are you fillable? What does the vessel, what kind of shape is the vessel in? In antiquity, they moved oil, wine, vinegar, etc. in what was known as wine skins. And they were simply the skins of a dead animal. And they sewed up all the, you know, so they could carry it around, these weird-looking skin bag kind of things full of liquid. So glad I live in 2023 that we're not drinking wine out of dead goat skins, aren't you? Yeah. All right. And so, but that wine skin is taken from the skin of a dead animal. Now watch this. That wine skin is at its moment of greatest flexibility closest to the moment of mortality of that animal. Flexibility, mortality, flexibility, capacity. And the more flexible, the greater the capacity. Oh, we want the flexibility. We want the capacity. We just don't want the mortality that comes with it. And so some of you found yourself in a unique season of having to die to certain things. Let me tell you, God is preparing your wineskin for more of him. 
relying on someone else's oil. It's time to stop clicking, liking. Who, Pastor Greg, he just studies that Bible. I just love his preaching. He can, I can almost get through Wednesday on my Sunday sermon. It's not enough. You can't rely on someone else's oil. You got to get your own. And lastly, recognizing what you have and releasing it. You know how you get empty? You simply pour out what you have. It's not complicated. And the more that you pour out, guess what? God, it's never a supply problem. There's always plenty more. Well, God, if I, if, 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 if I take my time, if, if I share, if, if, I, if I give of my tithes and my offerings, my, if, then I won't have any. That's just a poverty mentality that flies in the face of a father who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the silver and the gold and the Holy Spirit and willing to pour back into us. But the reality is, are we willing to continue to pour out what we have that when we come into a season of revival, there are ditches of preparation, there are wineskins that are prepared, is that when God begins to pour himself out, guess what? There's room. There's room. What have I said today? We're coming to, into a historic moment, ladies and gentlemen. We really are. And I'm not just trying to be hyperbolous again on a Sunday. I'm not the only one preaching this message. This is happening. And I don't know about you. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it. And we're really only left with two questions. Survival or revival. Hate to be the one to tell you, things are not getting any better in the world. And they're not going to. You know why? Because God is not afraid of operating against the backdrop of darkness. He really isn't. And all of the systems that we had placed our hopes in, education, government, the economy, they're all systematically crumbling. They really are, because they're kingdoms of this world. And you see, revival is a superimposition of God's kingdom on the kingdoms of this world. But he's going to do it not by just reviving those mountains of influence, but one person at a time. That's how he's going to do it. And even in, within churches, people sitting on the same row, this person will be right under the water spout of revival. And this person will miss it. It's going to be really interesting that in the same church, you're going to have completely divergent testimonies. But you don't have to miss it. Because God is creating a wineskin and a vessel to contain that which he's pouring out. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for these men and women. God, this great church, we thank you that you are breaking the roadblocks. And you are supernaturally breaking the dam of that which is held back, that which you have desired and designed for this people. So, Lord, bless his pastor, his wife, the team here. And, Lord, thank you that you have chosen us in this hour, in this generation, to steward that which you're doing on the planet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us at the Grace Honolulu YouTube channel. If you'd like to receive more sermons or content, please subscribe. And if you'd like to give, you can give at gracehonolulu.org. Have an amazing day, and we'll see you next time. God bless.